the United States has seen a lot of interest in the preservation of honeybees. Um, people are really starting to, to latch on to this idea that bees are incredibly important and we have to do something to rescue the populations from the issues that they're having. But the very first question that needs to be answered is what are the issues that these bees are dealing with? Why are they dying? Why are we having such a difficult time uh, maintaining populations where it was not quite this difficult prior? And so um, when I became a graduate student, I wanted to jump into a study that would allow me to impact a problem that, uh, I, that I knew a lot of people were focusing on and trying to figure out. And eventually that led me around to working with Varroa Destructor. So I'll give you uh, a presentation uh, that will explain what I did as a, a graduate student at the University of Maryland College Park. And uh, hopefully you guys will be interested in this information. So, to start, we need to just go into a little bit of obligatory background about Varroa destructor. And this is an organism that really needs no introduction, but uh, for anyone who has not had the opportunity to see it quite this close, you are staring into the face of evil. If you're having a difficult time locating that face, it's right there. That's, that's the face there, and it's... Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if you had a difficult time finding that because these creatures don't have an eye, they don't, don't have any eyes, they don't have a nose, they're just strange organisms in general. But we knew that this particular organism, as small as it seems, as insignificant as it seems, was a really different kind of parasite. Because when it arrived in the US, we had already been exposed to some parasites from overseas. We had already dealt with uh, the, the honeybee tracheal mites, uh, issues like nosema have, have shown up, and we realized parasites come, they go, it's usually not the end of the world, right? For Varroa, they arrived in the U.S. in 1987. Uh, I had nothing to do with it, I was negative two at the time, but there are a lot of beekeepers who actually remember what it was like before Varroa arrived. My advisor, Dennis Van Engelstorp, uh, when I was a graduate student, he used to always tell me, uh, before Varroa arrived, you could be a bee haver. But now that Varroa is here, you have to be a beekeeper. And I think that that really sums things up. Uh, a good example of this is the fact that Varroa arrived in 1987. By 1997, all of our wild bees were dead. That should tell you something right there. The unmanaged populations of honeybees could not deal with this parasite. Uh, and we went from having a very, very, very large population of unmanaged honeybees and uh, tree holes and, and stumps and all kinds of things to none. It is very difficult to find any now. Uh, most of them are just swarms from the same season. So we know that this is a next level kind of parasite. This organism causes uh, a lot of issues. And the biggest question that we should have is how does it do this? How does it create so many problems for honeybees and so quickly? Well, uh, we need to think for a moment about the relationship between this parasite and its host. Because Varroa destructor and Apis mellifera are not actually the original host parasite complex. The Varroa actually used to parasitize uh, a smaller bee, Apis serena, uh, and is an Asian honeybee, and they had a, a very uh, well-defined relationship evolutionarily. And then one parasitic mite one day decided, I want to see the world. And as a result of this decision, uh, we have Varroa on pretty much every region of this planet except Australia. Australia is the only place in the world, aside from small outlying island territories that are distributed about, where you won't find Varroa destructor. Uh, but the rest of the world has been heavily impacted by the presence of this organism. They were first found in Indonesia uh, in 1904, and Southeast Asia is the native range of this parasite. And then they started spreading uh, around the world. Now, uh, all of the different countries where they've ended up have had much higher losses as a result of this parasite. And so it might surprise you to find out that with us being aware of this parasite since 1904, studying it, learning about it, that one of the fundamental elements of this creature's biology is something that has been a mystery to us for the entirety of that time. What is this parasite doing to this honeybee? It's a good question. Because we're not even sure if it's feeding on it right now. Uh, we're not sure what it's feeding on if it's feeding. 
That has been an open question in science, and people have not known that it was an open question in science as a result of the spread that I was just telling you about. So bear with me for a moment. We're going to go back to this map, and I want you to notice something. When Varroa moved outside of its native range, this, this purple area right here, uh, it moved into China and it moved into Russia. And those were the first areas where Varroa was an invasive species. And so those were the first times where people were motivated to study this organism. As a result of that, all of the fundamentals of Varroa's biology are written about in papers that are in Russian and in Chinese. And for that reason, by the time Varroa arrived in the U.S., we actually didn't know much about it because all of that information was locked up in languages that we did not understand. And so there are a few elements of the, uh, the, the just a few fundamental elements of the biology of this parasite that have sort of remained open. Uh, a good and very important example for that is that the feeding of Varroa what we think we know about this comes from a paper written in the early 1960s. And it said that this organism, uh, the, the study that was conducted, was conducted in Russia. The, the, the idea of it was to determine what is the volume of tissue that the mite is removing from the bees when it feeds. But because of some issues with translation, um, when we found this information, we thought that the person was determining the content of the meal itself. And so while they assumed that it was the bee's blood, there was no study actually conducted to determine what those mites were eating. So even though every poster, every publication, every fact sheet will tell you within the first three sentences, Varroa is feeding on the bee's blood, that's actually a result of some translation issues that we've had with Russian. Uh, no one's ever actually proven that Varroa feeds on the bee's blood. So my idea, was to tackle this for my PhD research. What exactly is Varroa feeding on? But I'll tell you, I was a little bit nervous. I was a little bit nervous about this because the way that things work in the US, you actually don't get your PhD if you don't provide an original contribution to the scientific community. You need to tell us something that we did not know already, uh, or we're not giving it to you. And so there are a lot of students who, um, they, they kind of become career graduate students because every time their project doesn't pan out, they have to start another one and another one and another one. So if I started this project and later on found out that there really wasn't anything to, to find here, there's no there there, I'd have to start over with another one. So I decided before getting into this project, there are a few expectations that I wanted to look into, uh, a few things that I wanted to determine before I sank a lot of time into this to determine if it is likely that Varroa is feeding on something other than the bee's blood. Uh, if all three of these expectations are met, the plan was to not pursue this as my PhD project because it's likely the mites are feeding on the bee's blood, uh, the guess was correct, and we can move on with our lives. However, if all three of these expectations are not met, then they're probably feeding on something else, and this could be a really interesting project to go with. So, the very first of those expectations if Varroa is feeding on the bee's blood, we would expect that their excrement and their, the, the general structuring of their digestive system would show that. If an organism is feeding on a very dilute fluid, they have a very different kind of excrement and a very different kind of digestive system uh, than a creature that feeds on solid food. It's goes to show. And so we're going to start with the poop. I'm sure that's something you hear in a lot of presentations. Let's, let's go with the excrement. Varroa's fecal matter is strange. Uh, you may have seen uh, on the inside a very dark comb, these white splotches. This is actually the excrement of Varroa destructor. Uh, they actually have a communal toilet inside of those cells, so everybody inside the cell all just kind of deposits it in the same area. Uh, this allowed for researchers to be able to quickly analyze large amounts of Varroa's excrement. And what we found are two interesting things. One, there is pretty much no water content to their excrement at all, which is odd, very odd. Because if you are consuming something like blood, which is mostly water, you have to get rid of that excess water somehow. Varroa don't seem to be doing that at all. Their excrement is an incredibly dry crystal that comes out of the back end of their body. So that was odd. 
But the contents of that crystal are even more odd, in my opinion. Uh, Varroa's excrement is made up of a bunch of crystals uh, that are called purines. Uh, they are a nucleic acid, and they are an element that you typically find as a result of the breakdown of organ meats, not from the breakdown of blood. Curious. Very curious. Now, that may not sound quite so odd to you. But to a guy like me, um, it, it sounded pretty weird. And I'll tell you a bit of a story to explain to you why that sounded odd. And so I'm going to have to bring you into my life for a second. Are you guys okay with that? Yeah? All right. Okay. So this is going to seem unrelated, but stick with me, I promise. All right? You'll see where we're going. So back in the day, when I was a graduate student, early in my, my grad student career, uh, I would... Uh, hang out with my parents uh, for dinner very frequently. We would uh, eat dinner together. They would ask me about my research, but uh, on a rather peculiar evening when I was still trying to figure out if I wanted to study Varroa for my PhD work, uh, I do recall my dad saying to me, uh, look here, Sammy, uh, I got gout. The doctor tells me that I got the gout, and uh, I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't really understand what's going on with it. See, the doctor says that it's because of my diet. But then I changed my diet, and I still got the gout. I, don't, I, don't, I, I need my scientist son to explain to me what I need to do about this gout. I said, okay, Dad. Uh, that's, that's a little bit odd because I'm not a doctor yet. And even if I were, I wouldn't be that kind of doctor. Like, that's not my jurisdiction. If your skeleton is inside of your body, you are outside of my jurisdiction. I don't, I don't do that kind of doctoring. But uh, any of you who have uh, PhDs of any sort in your family, you probably know, uh, if you've got doctor next to your name, everybody brings you their medical issues. All of their medical issues. You can look down my Facebook wall now. It's just people with pictures of their ankle. Hey, I've got this rash on my ankle, and I was wondering if you might know what it is. You're not an insect. I don't know what this is, but this is my dad, this is my family, I love him, so I did what I feel like any good doctor would do. I googled it, and um, I found that gout is the result of the buildup of purine crystals in an individual's blood, which I found to be very fascinating, because the purine crystals build up because the individual is getting so much of something in their diet that is breaking down into purines that their body is not able to filter it out. So, I started thinking, is it possible that if Varroa and my dad are both breaking down some sort of food that's turning into the same thing in their bodies, could it be that they are consuming something very similar? At the top of every list of what you should not eat if you have gout, was always liver. Liver, pound for pound, ounce for ounce, breaks down into the largest amount of purines of pretty much anything that you can consume. So that got me thinking. I wonder what the bee's liver is, and I wonder if the mites could be eating that. Now, those of you who have never been to a Samuel Ramsey presentation, you might not know this, but I tend to run them like a mystery novel. So I'm going to sprinkle a few clues here and there, and I'm going to wait on you guys to connect the dots. I believe in all of you. You got this, okay? All right? Okay. So we're going to keep moving with this, because here's what we've noticed so far. The excrement of these mites is absolutely the, the polar opposite of what we would expect if these creatures were feeding on blood. It is far too dry, and it is not made out of the right stuff. Weird. But what about their digestive system? Is the digestive system of the Varroa uh, conducive to a diet that is primarily water? If you're feeding on something that is mostly water, you have to have some method of moving that water through your body in a way where it is not going to impact your cells. Because the cells in your body will absorb that water, they'll swell to a really large size, and if you absorb too much water, they will die. Those cells will pop, they'll lice. And so organisms that feed exclusively on dilute fluids, uh, things like blood or the phloem that comes from plants, so think about aphids, those creatures have a very specialized digestive system that looks like this. So this is the typical true bug digestive system. Think creatures like bed bugs having one like this. So the way that it works 
This is the esophagus of the organism. It runs into the creature's body, and right here where it transitions into being the gut, it loops around and it touches the rectum. This is the rectum of the organism, and it exchanges all of that excess water that would be going through the creature's body directly into the rectum, so it never passes through the gut. This is the region of the digestive system where nutrients are absorbed, and before uh, the meal can actually get there, they exchange it directly into the gut. All of that water goes out of the creature's body so that they don't have to deal with the burden um, that comes with that much water uh, in your diet. And a good example of that would be organisms like tsetse flies. Uh, tsetse flies feed on, on human blood, uh, they feed uh, and this should show you uh, a tsetse fly feeding on a person. And you'll see that the organism's abdomen, this is what I want you to focus in on. This region of the body is the abdomen of the tsetse fly. The way that it works is that the tsetse fly's body uh, swells up very rapidly, and then they actually have to stop feeding for a moment, and they have to deposit fluid on the host. So notice this. Uh, right here, this is the, 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 the anus of the tsetse fly. Uh, there's a bunch of water that actually has to come out of its body before it can continue feeding uh, because that abdomen has a limit to the amount that it can swell. Now, what do you think would happen if this creature kept feeding at the same rate that it was feeding earlier? You saw how much its abdomen expanded, correct? What would happen next? Yeah, it would definitely burst. There is a limit to how much an organism like this can swell. And so uh, the concern, uh, what you should know from something like this is that if Varroa is feeding on the blood of its host, we should see the mite swell, and then we should see it deposit uh, fluid on the other side. We should also be able to look at their digestive system and see that they have this same chamber mechanism uh, that allows them to exchange water. And what you'll see in this video of Varroa feeding, when it loads, uh, is that uh, Varroa's digestive system isn't even remotely shaped like the one that you saw earlier. Uh, it is simply a tube that runs, uh, diverts uh, around uh, part of the, the, the mite's other internal organs and then straight down to the rectum. So you just have a tube going down. And at the end of this tube uh, is, of course, the rectum. And there is no fluid deposited on the host uh, when these organisms are feeding. In addition to that, they do not swell in the process of feeding either. So this is Varroa destructor. Uh, sorry, the drone's leg is in the way, but it's feeding on drone pupa. And I want you to notice that you can see its digestive system running through its body. You can see the peristaltic motion of that digestive system moving food to the rectum, but there's no fluid being deposited here. Now, this is really fascinating, not just for the fact that the mite doesn't swell up, not just for the fact that the mite is not depositing fluid on the other side, but because we can see a very white, viscous substance moving through the digestive system of that mite. And uh, just as another clue for you guys, bee blood is not white, neither is it viscous. Hmm. Yes, yes, quite, quite fascinating. Okay, so... That means the very first of the expectations that I had uh, at the beginning of this study is not met. Uh, the mites do not have the right digestive system. They do not have the right excrement to be feeding on the bee's blood. So that just left me with the impression that I need to look more closely at this situation, but not any conclusions yet. Um, there could be something else weird going on here. Uh, I really wanted to look more closely at this, this whole subject. And so uh, I then started looking at the actual lineage of the mites, their relationships to other organisms. If the mites do feed on the host's blood, we would expect that they would be related to other blood-feeding mites. Things like ticks, uh, which are mites that feed on the blood of uh, uh, usually mammals, um, some birds. Uh, there are also these things called feather mites that feed on the blood of chickens. Uh, if any of you raise chickens, you've probably seen feather mites before. They can make all of your, your chicken's feathers fall off. We would expect that Varroa would actually be closely related to these organisms if it is truly a blood feeder. And so I decided to look at something called a phylogenetic tree. The phylogenetic tree shows the relatedness of a bunch of different organisms, but it is a terrible thing to ever put into a presentation because, come on, who can read this? Who can read this? This is just awful. So allow me to use my magic wand to highlight a few things for you because I can enlarge it a bit. So these are all of the arachnids. Uh, a bunch of spiders and things up here, and this is the part 
of the tree where we get to the mites. So these are um, Argacid ticks, Ixodes ticks, these are the ticks that you see feeding on animals, uh, drinking their blood, and Orthonysis mites, the ones that uh, actually feed on the feathers of creatures. So this is where um, the mites get started, and everything else on this tree is mites. So the closer organisms are on this tree, the more closely related they are. The farther away they are from each other, the more distantly related. So Varroa should be very close to the Argacid ticks or the Ixodes ticks on this tree. But where do you think Varroa actually is? No? Did, did someone see the bottom? Did you see the bottom? You've got really good eyes. As, as blurry as this is, all the way at the bottom of this tree is Varroa destructor. It could not be more distantly related from the other blood feeders in their lineage. There's just in evolutionary time, they're as far away as they can be. But it, that's not the only thing that you can learn from this. If we actually blow this up and give you the opportunity to, to look at which mites they are related to, and I'm sure you guys have already guessed, I'm sure you know it's the, the Gamma Cephas, the Macrochiles, the Lysiaceus, and the Cosmolalaps mites. Of course, of course. What else would they be related to? Uh, and please do remember those names. They will be on the exam at the end. <laughs> now, uh, the... The, these mites are really important for one reason. All of these mites feed on their host through a process called extraoral digestion, their host or whatever prey they're consuming. So instead of walking up to a creature and biting it, they stick their mouth parts inside, release a, a volume of uh, digestive enzymes that break down the internal organs of that creature into a fluid, and they suck that out of the creature's body. Why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this because they have very similar mouth parts and digestive system structures to Varroa, which means there's a suggestion there that Varroa feeds in a very similar way to the way that they feed. Rather than feeding on blood, which you would expect they would have mouth parts that are sort of like a stylet or a straw, they just suck blood out of a creature, they have mouth parts like these guys that allow them to release digestive enzymes from their digestive system into a host, potentially break down its organs. Hmm. Interesting. Now, that means the first two of our expectations are not met. That leaves me with just one more, and then I've got to marry this project. So uh, I was starting to get a little bit excited about what could possibly come from a project like this, but the very last of my expectations was one where I couldn't find the information present uh, in the, the previous literature, and I've realized I'm going to have to actually start an experiment in order to determine the answer to this one. Because we've already looked at their digestive system. You can tell a lot about a creature, uh, a lot about what a creature eats from its digestive system and what comes out the back end. You can tell a lot about a creature by the organisms that it's related to. But you can also tell a lot about what a creature eats by where it feeds. If a tick or a mosquito uh, they, they, something that we can tell about the way that they feed is that they're feeding on a tissue that's present all over your body. Because mosquitoes and ticks can feed pretty much anywhere on a person. They can draw blood to the surface. So clearly they're feeding on a tissue that's not specific to just one region. But if Varroa feeds only in one spot, maybe they're feeding on a tissue that's only present in just that spot. So if we're trying to find out what they're eating on the bees, we need to look at where they feed on the bees. So the expectation here is that Varroa, if they're feeding on the bee's blood, will feed anywhere on the bee. But if they are feeding on a specific organ or something of that nature, they should only feed in one area. And so I actually went into our colonies, uh, pulled out brood frames, uh, pulled off the, the nurse bees on those brood frames and looked at where the mites were feeding on those bees to determine what it is that they might be eating. Using this as a data sheet, I then recorded where the mites were located on those bees, and these were the results of that study. Now, just to orient you to the colors that you see here, uh, the red and yellow areas, these are the only areas of the bee's body where we ever saw the mite feeding. Uh, the blue areas are places where we found the mites. Uh, they were not uh, feeding in these regions, but they were present, but the red and yellow areas those are the only places where we saw the mites feeding. So you might notice something there. Uh, there is a very pronounced preference for just one region of the bee's body. They only feed on the underside of the bee's abdomen. 
more than 95% of the observations, we found them in these regions of the bee's body. And why, why is that even important? Well, one, it's important for us to determine where the mites are feeding, but two, it is important for us to consider that even though a lot of the pictures that we see of Varroa are this image right here, where the mite is riding on the bee's thorax, that's not actually where you're most likely to find this parasite. And that's important because it relates to this graph that you'll see right here. With the Bee Informed Partnership, uh, I've, I've worked closely with beekeepers, asking them different questions about how they manage their colonies. And one of the things that we ask them is, do you treat for Varroa? And what most beekeepers tell us is no. I do not treat for Varroa. I do nothing to manage the populations of mites in my colony, which I was originally shocked by and a little bit concerned with. Uh, this is information that was uh, taken from uh, a survey that we conducted about five years ago, and we continue conducting the survey every few years, and the trend has been going in the wrong direction. Uh, it's gone up to 62% now from 58%. So the majority of beekeepers are not treating. And what our question was, was why? I thought that the answer would be, um, I am, uh, I've decided I want to be a non-treatment beekeeper. I don't want to put any chemicals into my colony. That's why I don't treat for the mites. Turns out that wasn't it. Most of the beekeepers told us I would treat if I had Varroa, but I don't have Varroa. Interesting. Tell me more. How are you monitoring for the mites inside of your colony? And so on this survey, we give them two options, a sugar roll or an alcohol wash, because we thought there were only two options. There are two ways to monitor. They drew a third box invariably and told us, no, 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 no. I do a visual inspection. So I go through my colonies and I'll look at the frames and I'll watch the bees running around and if I don't see a big red dot on their thorax, I don't treat the colonies. This is what people look for in their colonies when they're looking for Varroa. And the idea that they have in their minds is that there is a very conspicuous red bump that should be on the top of the bee's thorax. And if they don't see that, they're out of the woods. And that's concerning because you might finally see that but 95% of the mites are on the underside of the bee's body. And so if you wait until you get to this point to start treating where you're seeing a bunch of these, you have a much bigger problem than you think you have. And an even more uh, concerning element of that, well, let me tell you this. The mites that are on the bee's thorax are in a very specific part of their life cycle, and it's called the questing period. It's when they climb onto the highest point on a creature, the same way that ticks do, when they want to get off so that they can find uh, another host. So ticks will do this on a blade of grass or something. They'll climb to the highest point. They'll wave their front legs around and wait for something to show up that they can climb onto. Varroa do this when their host is no longer suitable for them to continue feeding on. They have drained out so much of what it was that they were eating that this bee is no longer a healthy host for them to eat or because the colony is collapsing and they need to climb onto a forager and be flown out of the colony to another location. So another reason that beekeepers have told us they don't treat is because I treated my colony and it still died last year, and so I'm never treating again. It even leads to them having less trust uh, in scientists because we tell them all the time, if you treat your colonies, you will have fewer losses. And they tell us, no, I treated and I still lost them. Well, when you treat is just as important as if you treat. And if you wait until your bees have had so much of their internal uh, contents pulled out of their body, and then you decide to treat, your bees are walking around, they're dead and just don't know it yet. And the treatment is probably of very little value. So I need you guys to help me out. You may have heard that the title of my presentation was Varroa Feeds on Hemolymph. Hemolymph is bee blood. Varroa Feeds on Hemolymph and Two Other Alternative Facts. Do you guys know what alternative facts are? I know I'm just across the pond, and this is, a, this is kind of an American thing. It's an American thing that I wish wasn't an American thing. But uh, we have been told that we are now a post-factual society. Yeah, you've, you've, you've heard this? Oh, Lord. Okay, so... <laughs> So here's where we are right now. Uh, in a post-factual society, the facts are not nearly as important as how you feel. Do you feel that Varroa are a problem? Because if you don't, they're not. 
Do you feel that you should be finding the mites on top of the bee's thorax? Because that's just as important as what the data shows. Well, well, alternative facts, the definition is very simple. It sounds like a complicated thing, but the definition is very simple. Alternative facts are lies. Alternative facts are things that are incorrect. They are not really helping anyone, but they still persist in society because people like to say this thing or believe this thing, or people unfortunately have not been exposed to the truth. So I'm exposing all of you uh, to the fact that this is an alternative fact, that you will find Varroa on top of your worker bee's thorax most of the time? No. No, no, no. You will not usually find them on top of your worker bee's thorax. You usually find them under the bee's abdomen. And so if you think that a visual inspection is an effective means for you to gauge whether you have Varroa in your colony, you are sorely mistaken, and it will likely lead to you taking remediative efforts far too late. So do keep that in mind, but more than keeping that in mind, you can help me if you'll help to disseminate that this is the truth and that uh, the, the alternative fact is unhelpful. Uh, and yeah, I did pose for that picture over there. It was not looking good. It was, it was nice how they, they did me up. It was before I got my hair cut. Anyway, so um, alternative facts. Uh, I promised you three alternative facts in this presentation, and so there's another to come. You may have noticed that the first is that Varroa feeds on the bee's blood. Spoiler alert, they're not feeding on the bee's blood. Okay. All right. So this is actually what you should expect to see if you have Varroa feeding on your bees. They will actually be wedging themselves between the plates that make up the bee's abdomen. And I can actually enlarge that a bit. So you can see the mite is actually between those plates that all come together to make the bee's abdomen that telescoping part of their body that it is. And the time where you will see them on the thorax, well, this image shows you very well. There's a real estate crisis going on on this bee. There are so many mites on this bee that the region of the bee's body where the mites like to feed is already taken. And so you'll see that there are mites climbing off onto the top of the bee's thorax, or abdomen and then climbing onto the thorax so that they can escape. And if you look closely, you can see that the front legs are raised. That is typical questing posture. That's what they do when they need to climb off onto a new host. So. This is what you should expect to find uh, with the mites inside of your colony. And uh, if, if I may, an odd part of what you're seeing here is how the mite actually blurs the line between uh, uh, an internal parasite and an external parasite. Because you'll notice they're technically outside of the bee's body, but they've wedged themselves so far in between those plates that most of their bodies are kind of hidden from the bee itself. But what we really need to know, and this is, um, uh, a confocal microscope image, courtesy of the United States Department of Agriculture, letting me use their scopes. This is one of the plates that makes up the bee's body, and that is Varroa destructor in the middle. And let me see if I can actually make that bigger for you. There you go. All right, so this is one of the plates that makes up the bee's body. That's Varroa that's wedged itself in between, and that's another plate that the, the mite is actually standing on right there. So they are really in there. They have wedged themselves pretty far into the bee's body. And that makes them difficult to groom off, difficult to remove, but it also allows them access to a very special part of the bee's body. In between each one of those plates, there is a very, very, very thin membrane. It is called the intersegmental membrane, and it allows those bees to do all of the cool gymnastics that you see them doing in the colony. If any of you ever grabbed a bee and had it double its body back around and sting you in the thumb, you've been there before? I've been there many times many times in my day. The reason why their body is so flexible is because of that really thin articulatable membrane that they have there. But because that membrane is so thin, Varroa are able to pierce it there and, and feed. And what I needed to know is what tissue is exactly on the other side of this membrane? Because there we go, I can get my PhD now. We probably know what they're eating right there. What tissue is on the other side of this membrane? So I thought that things had, things had progressed in a good direction. I thought that we were moving towards the end of this project already. When some researchers who we were working with on this stopped me and said, Sammy, your project is really cool. Uh, we, we, we like that you've, you've done this, but it doesn't show what you think it shows because Varroa aren't feeding on the adult bees. They only feed on the brood. Now, I furrowed my eyebrow more than my eyebrows have ever been furrowed in life. Like, the furrows were deep. 
like the Marianas Trench, because if they're not feeding on the adult bees, what's happening during the winter? The whole time that they're in that cluster, they've got to be eating something. And the researchers say, well, no, uh, it's, it's very possible that they're just feeding on fat reserves that they have inside of their body that are sustaining them during the winter, like, you know, a bear or something, but uh, they're not feeding on the adult bees. They don't, they don't do that. And I was really surprised by the confidence with which this was said. Like, there was just surety here. And so I wanted to investigate further. Why don't you think they're feeding on the adult bees? And they told me they, they, they are not feeding on the adult bees, and that's clear to us, because we have never seen a feeding wound on an adult bee before. Never once in the more, what, 115 years that we've been studying this organism, no one has ever seen a feeding wound on an adult bee. We have multiple papers that show you the feeding wounds on larvae, that show you the entire structuring of it and the insides of it from different angles, but no one has ever shown a feeding wound on an adult bee. And that level of negative data seems to strongly suggest they're not eating the adult bees if we've never seen any damage. Except this. You guys are, are, are seeing what the problem is here, right? The mite's mouth is under this plate. And if you would like to see a feeding wound, you'd have to move this plate. The bees don't like that. They're not a fan. They're not a fan of you, you doing that kind of thing. And they will resist, and any resistance that they provide will tear that very thin membrane, and you won't be able to tell whether you caused that damage or if the bee did. And so researchers uh, have not been able to see this for quite some time, and I really wanted to show them for sure that these mites were feeding on the adult bees. And so what I did was I took... Oh, well, yes. So the expectations are not met. Um, you see that all three of them are. And so I jumped into this project as... Um, as, as my PhD project. And so in order to show that the mites were actually feeding, we took a bee with a mite on it and dipped it in liquid nitrogen. And this stuff is cool, really cool, like negative 196 degrees Celsius cool. And so uh, at this point, I should say that some bees were harmed in the making of this study, <laughs> but they did not suffer, I promise. It's very, very quick. Now, the bee is frozen solid, the mite is frozen solid. And so uh, this, is, this is the bee's body right here, one of those plates that I was talking about. This is your varroa mite, and that is the plate that is hiding the mite's mouth parts. And so in order to see what was going on, now that everything is frozen in place, we actually took the mite, stuck a pin under it on each side, and then levered it up. Popped the mite off, sent it flying, and this is what we were then able to see. See anything interesting there? Anything cool? So, usually people can't see until we restore the color that uh, there are a few interesting things going on here. Now, when you look at this, I want you to think silly putty. Do you guys remember silly putty? Is silly putty just an American thing? No? Okay, you guys remember silly putty. So yeah, you could take this stuff. I don't remember silly putty, but my parents remember it for me. And they tell me that you could take this stuff and you could press it up against an object, and when you pull it off, it has the indentation of that thing on it. The bee's membrane is so pliable that when the mites press themselves against it, you get the entire indentation of their body in that membrane. And so uh, we were originally wondering, what is this object? And that object, these twin objects over on the sides, and it perplexed us for a moment, but I wonder, what do you guys think those are? Anchor points. No, I'm sorry? Anchor points. Anchor points, yeah. yes. And what do you think the, the things are that are, are there? Like yes, you are correct. You are good at this. Thank yes, you. all right, all right, okay. I like you, I like you. <laughs> So uh, normally people are a little bit nervous to answer and it takes a long time. You just threw it right on out there with the correct answer on the first try. She said that those are anchor points. And when I asked her what, what are the anchor points themselves, she said those are the feet. Those are the mite's feet. We popped the entire mite off and its feet stayed behind. So that should show you that they are really well anchored into your bees. But the reason why that was so helpful for us is because it allowed us to immediately know what this indentation was on the bee's body. If that's the foot, then this is the leg that's imprinted against the body. And that's the other leg. You can even see the hairs that are uh, going out of it, the indentation of the hairs. But right in the middle of those two feet, where there should be an indentation of the mite's mouth parts, instead, we just find a hole. 
a very ragged hole. Fascinating, right? So at that point, I felt like we had very clear information here that Varroa is actually sticking its mouth through these bees. It has created a feeding wound on the adult bees. And just to make sure that the other researchers that we were talking to were satisfied, because two of these researchers were our collaborators on this project, uh, I decided to measure both the wound and the mouth parts of the mite to be totally sure that the mouth parts actually cause this, this hole. And they're exactly the same size, the diameter of the mouth parts, the diameter of the hole. And we even colored the mouth parts of the mites so that you can see which regions of the mouth cause which sections of this hole. So there's the bottom jaw of the mites, or the subcapitulum is what it's called in mites, and that is the chalicera that they use to actually cut the hole open. So there you go. I won. Woo! <laughs> <sighs> so by this point, I thought, you know what? It's clear. The mites are feeding on the bees. Now I can move on with figuring out what they're feeding on. Let me talk to you just for a moment about terminology. Varroa has two phases of its life cycle. You've heard this, correct? And the two phases are the reproductive phase and the phoretic phase. Does anyone know what the term phoresy or phoretic means? Transport. Transport. Correct. Exactly right. Oh my gosh. Okay. Uh, I was speaking to, uh, I think, the, the Louth County beekeepers. Did I pronounce that right? Uh, and it was the first time that I have ever given this presentation and somebody knew the answer to that question. And this is the second time in Ireland. So uh, you guys, vocabulary clearly is your thing. Um, the term foresee or phoretic, it means that um, something is being moved around. It is in transit. And so the bees are supposedly just moving the mites to another location during this period of their life cycle. But the mites are not parasitic during this phase. Uh, the term foresee is a special ecological term. It refers to one creature that is smaller, attaching to a larger creature and allowing that creature to move them around because they are less mobile. So this is a good example of a phoretic creature. This is a pseudoscorpion attached to a beetle. Notice that the mouth parts of the pseudoscorpion are here, and the place where they attach to the beetle, they use simply their, their pincers and snag on there. Now why is that important? The moment that you decide to bite that creature and siphon something out of it, you incentivize that creature to murder you. If you bite me, you are a totally different issue than if you just latch on and you're going in the same direction that I am. Because then you're, if you're just going the same direction as me, you're a hitchhiker. Doesn't matter. I was already going there. You can come with me. So foresee gets pretty extreme in the insect world. There is actually a beetle under all of those red bumps. All of those red bumps are individual mites that want to ride on that beetle to another location. Notice the beetle makes no attempt to get rid of them because it doesn't matter. They're just hanging on to its body while it goes where it's already going. So that's the image that we have been conveying to people of Varroa, that it is simply attaching to the bee, like all of those, these little red mites here that are on top of this beetle, uh, and they're simply being moved around. They're not biting the creature. They're not removing any tissue. But I think that that is fundamentally incorrect. And let me show you how we were able to prove that. So, using another one of the incredibly expensive and kind of frightening microscopes at the USDA, uh, we were able to actually section through a bee and look at the insides of the bee and the mite. So this is Varroa destructor right here. It is in between those two plates that we were talking about earlier. This is the membrane that the mites feed through, that intersegmental membrane. And I really want you to pay attention to this set of tissue right back here. Uh, and I'm gonna open the floor for guesses as to what this tissue is. Any ideas? Oh, you're good. Oh, wow. All right, somebody's cheating. Somebody's heard this presentation before, or you've already read the paper. One of these. Um, both of those answers were correct. Someone said liver and someone said fat body. Uh, the liver in insects is called the fat body. It is a very important tissue with a number of different functions. And what we found most fascinating about this is that when Varroa was present in this region of the bee's body, well, well, sorry, let's start from the other way around. We cut through these bees and mites. We did this several times. And when there was no mite present, when we cut through bees that did not have a mite in this region of its body, this tissue looked very different. Instead of just kind of stopping short, it ran all the way under this membrane and formed a very dense mass 
right under the intersegmental membrane. However, when there was a mite present there, a whole section of that tissue was missing, as it is in this image. And the longer the mite was present, the more of that tissue was missing. Curious. We got even closer because we wanted to see exactly what's going on in the wound. So this is a, a highly magnified image of what you just saw a moment ago. And we kept seeing these little blobs of mystery stuff. Uh, I believe the, the technical term we use in science is schmutz. And so we kept seeing the schmutz on the inside of the wound. We weren't sure what it was until we got even closer to it and were able to determine that all of those little bits and pieces are actually the insides of the liver cells. The insides of the liver cells, for some reason, are outside of the liver cells, broken down into something that is pretty much a fluid. The mites, when they stick their mouth parts into the bees, release a very large volume of saliva. And this saliva apparently breaks down the cells of the fat body into cream of honeybee soup. And that is deeply problematic. I promised you three alternative facts. The third of these alternative facts is that Varroa has a phoretic phase. We have been saying this for decades upon decades upon decades, and it is inaccurate. Uh, the mite is parasitic during both phases of its life cycle, when it's on your adult bees and when it's on your brood. Why is that important to you? That is the question, uh, that, is the, the, the question that I've asked after every one of these alternative facts, because I want you to know that this is not just a study that's there for water cooler intrigue the next time that you're at work. This actually does matter for your bees. If your bees are already above threshold, if you have a large volume of mites in your colony, and then you decide that you're going to do a brood break, what exactly are you doing to your bees? You are forcing the entire population of mites, the entire population of parasites, onto your adult bees. They are feeding constantly on those adult bees. They are turning their insides into a soup that is no longer functional for what it should be doing. And the population that they are most impacting are your nurse bees, the most important bees in the colony for developing the next generation of bees. And then when you finally get things reestablished, your queen is laying again, all these nurse bees have to get back to work and mobilize their energy to start feeding. And what tissue do they use to actually feed that next generation? Well, it's actually the fat body. It's the liver of the bee that produces those proteins that go to the hyperpharyngeal gland and they're then fed to your next generation of bees. And so even though uh, before, before you undertake any action in your colony, there's a risk-benefit analysis that occurs. The risk is this, the benefit is that. But what it turns out is we have not had all of the, the necessary parts of this equation to do an accurate risk-benefit analysis because we've been thinking there's only benefit to doing a brood break. There's no risk. Well, the risk that actually exists is that this could be very heavily negatively impacting your nurse bee population, and you need to think through whether your colony is strong enough to deal with that sort of issue. Now, that's only a matter to think about if you are already at threshold or above threshold, if you have a lot of mites in your colony. If you're doing this and you have low levels of mites to begin with, then that's a moot point, but it is at least worth considering under those circumstances. So uh, this particular image just helps to sum up what we were saying before, you know what, I'm, I'm going to back up for a moment though because um, that image took me a long time to get it and there weren't enough oohs and ahs when I unveiled it. <laughs> and I gotta say it hurt my feelings just a little bit. So we're going to back up and we're going to try this one more time. All right, one, two, three. Whoa. There we go. Thank you. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. You might not even know what you're looking at yet, but I appreciate that because uh, what you got here, <laughs> this is a freeze fracture. So Varroa destructor right here, I love this giant, uh, this, this just looks like really cool here. Um, so there, there's Varroa for you, uh, and this is a freeze fracture. So we actually cut through the bee and the mite at the same time so you can see the insides of both organisms in this huge image to tell us a lot about what's going on here. And something that you see is that there's a huge volume of fat body tissue, all of this liver, all of this liver right here. And then you look in the digestive system of Varroa, and things look very similar, don't they? Yes, yes, quite. Now, <laughs> now, now this, 
may seem like, okay, well, then the story's over. They're clearly feeding on the fat body. But things can look similar very easily uh, and still be different things. And so we wanted to move forward from this point uh, and make sure that we could very clearly show people what the mites are feeding. Are they feeding on this tissue right here, the fat body? This is the abdomen of a bee that's been cut open, folded open like a clamshell. Digestive system has been removed, and the, the tissue that you see there, all of the tissue that you see there, is fat body. The largest continuous organ inside of your bee's body is the fat body, and that should tell you something very important right there. This tissue is incredibly important. It takes up so much space. It, it is wrapped around pretty much every organ inside of the bee's body, uh, and it does a lot of work. Is this what the bees are eating? Or is this what the mites are eating? Well, in order to determine that, uh, I decided we're going to solve this problem. Um, we're going to solve this problem in a way that every scientist from the beginning of time has ever wanted to solve a problem using glowing fluids. Because some of you may have like Googled scientists before. The very first image that's going to come up is going to be an old guy in a lab coat with two tubes of glowing juice. That's just how we do science. That's what science is. It's glowing juice. And so, Glowing juice was used in this project. Um, inside of these tubes right here is a chemical called uranine O. It glows bright yellow only when in an aqueous substance. In something that is primarily water, it will glow very brightly yellow. And so it was perfect for us to feed to the bees in their sugar water to make their blood glow yellow. And then over here, you have Nile Red. Uh, this is a substance that glows very brightly red when attached to fats, and only when attached to fats. So we thought it would be perfect to stain the liver of the bee, and with both of these inside of the bee's body, you get this. So this is the abdomen of the bee, and you can see all of this yellow is from the blood, and this, these red sections here are the fat body. And so what we're working with is a system where, if uh, after we have exposed the mites to these bees, if the mites glow yellow, they're feeding on the bee's blood, the mites glow red, they're feeding on the bee's fat body. So this is sort of your uh, lights on blood, lights off blood, glowing yellow, and this is fat body, uh, and this is fat body that's been exposed to the Nile red, so it's glowing red. So just to recap, what color will the mites be glowing if they're feeding on the bee's blood? Yellow. And what color are they glowing if they're feeding on the bee's fat body? Red. Yeah, all right. <laughs> so, <laughs> So I was pretty excited by this point because they were glowing so brightly red that what I thought we were going to have to do was dissect the mites so that we can see the digestive system. They were glowing so brightly red that we could see it without even opening them up. Um, and then when you did dissect them, it was glowing so brightly that it overexposed the camera. Um, this is a mite where we've removed uh, the, the, the tissue around the digestive system. It so overexposed the camera, we had to reduce the exposure to even get this image. So there's a lot of red here. There's a lot of very bright red here. Uh, and we got even closer uh, using a confocal scope. Uh, these, this section of the bee's body is already uh, yellow uh, due to something called autofluorescence. Um, so it, it already produces a little bit of yellow light, but the digestive system is the region that I really want you to look at here. It does this looping motion uh, around the inside of the bee's body, or the mite's body, and all of that red, that's your fat body. There are little uh, dots that you can see all over it. Uh, those are globules, the way that, that fat... <laughs> all right, okay. <laughs> Very excited, very excited to hear this presentation. Uh, so all of those little globules there, that's fat body tissue inside of the digestive system of the mite, which I thought, well, okay, we've answered the question. Uh, I was very excited to have been able to do that, and I felt like there was still one big thing that I needed to answer for you guys. Why does this matter? If the mites are feeding on the bee's blood, if they're feeding on the bee's fat body, either way, they're feeding on your bees, and that's a problem, correct? There's a difference here. If you think about this the way that you think about mosquitoes or ticks, uh, so let's say a mosquito lands on you, sucks out some of your blood, moves on. It's not that big a deal, is it? You scratch a little bit, it gets a little itchy, but as long as that mosquito doesn't have a virus or some sort of parasitic bacterium to transmit to you, you're fine. That's what we've been thinking of with Varroa for a bit. As long as there are no viruses in that mite, it's really not that big a deal. 
But now think of it this way. If a mosquito landed on you, about right here, liquefied your liver and sucked that out of your body and flew off, would you be more concerned? <laughs> and I ask you this question and I just let me remind you that without your liver, you cannot drink alcohol. <laughs> All right. Okay. All right. So there you go. That's where we are right now. And so what I wanted to look at was, what does the fat body actually do inside of the bees and why does it matter? Well, it turns out the fat body conducts nine essential functions inside of your bees. And I'm going to go through a few of them really quickly and then I know that we are getting close to time. So I'm going to move through this quickly so that I can allow for you guys to have time for question and answer. Uh, though I do have an extra 10 minutes from the, yeah, all right, great. Growth and development. Growth and development is a result of the, let me not get too far from the microphone. Growth and development is a result of the fat body. Now some of you might be sitting here thinking, before today I've never even seen fat body before. Yeah, you have. Every single one of you, if you're a beekeeper, you've seen fat body. Uh, if you've ever seen your brood, you have seen fat body because their skin is transparent and all of that white gooey stuff inside of your brood is fat body tissue. And they need so much of it because it conducts the process of metamorphosis for this organism. So that squishy little sac that you see there, no legs, no eyes, no mouth, or well, de definitely a mouth, but no legs, no eyes, no wings, uh, no reproductive organs, everything that you need to turn that creature into a bee is already inside of that thing's body. And it just needs to be reorganized so that it can turn into that. And the tissue that allows for this reorganization to occur in a very efficient and organized manner is the fat body. It goes through the bee's body and these enzymes are breaking down all of the organs into their constituent parts. The fat body rounds all of that stuff up, puts it in neat little packages, and then slowly releases it so that it can be built back up into a totally new organism. So the fat body is really important and it's more than just body fat. People hear it, uh, they will sometimes summarize my presentation to other beekeepers and they'll say, uh, Samuel Ramsey's uh, study shows that the mites aren't feeding on the bees' blood, they're feeding on their body fat. All of those words were right. <laughs> the order for a couple of them wasn't quite great, but um, the, the fat body is more than just the body fat. It's an organ and it does some really important stuff. Case in point, nutrient storage and uh, metabolism are the result of the fat body functioning properly. The most energetically taxing thing that a bee will ever do is to fly. It takes a lot of energy to move that body because it is just, it's a, a large body to wing ratio. And so when they're about to fly off, they need to mobilize a huge amount of energy to their flight muscles. And the tissue that does that is the all right, that, that, that was a softball, guys. That, that was not a difficult question. And so the delayed reply there kind of concerns me. It leads me to believe that you guys might be a little bit intimidated by me. You might think that, you know, because I, I teach students and things that I, I'm going to throw out there just a, 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 a trick question for you. That's not my style. Um, I'm, I'm actually, I, I want you to think about this differently. I'm the son of a pastor. And so I want you guys to think about this like Sunday school, where the correct answer to every question is Jesus. <laughs> I want you to think that, but fat body. All right? Okay? All right. I believe in all of you. You got this. Okay. All right. I'm going to do this one more time. So, so their metabolic activity needs to be regulated and the tissue that regulates that is the there we go that's what i'm talking about all right hallelujah okay so the fat body tissue is so important for regulating their energy they would not be able to fly without it in addition to that oh and and, and the reason why there are these names under each of the the functions of the fat body is because those names correspond to a paper where uh, the authors of those papers described a pathology that's related to this function. Um, there have been a bunch of different pathologies, diseases and issues that the bees have that we have not been able to properly, properly categorize. We haven't been sure how do all of these problems come from a tiny mite feeding on a small amount of the bee's blood. How could this possibly cause that? And so at the end of the paper that describes uh, a really interesting pathology, the bees having enough energy to fly to the flowers, but for some reason not having the energy to make the return trip. 
they notice that this happens when the mites have fed on the bees before these trips. And they haven't been able to explain how the removal of a small amount of the bee's blood would cause a pathology of this nature. And actually, in the concluding paragraph, they actually say, we don't know how the removal of a small amount of the bee's blood would cause this particular pathology. But if we look at these different pathologies, what we find is that every single one of them is related to a disruption of the fat body's natural functioning. So I thought that was kind of cool. Like, check this one out. Water loss and osmoregulation. Your bees need to keep water inside of their body. Every organism does. But they have a more difficult time with it because when they're vibrating their flight muscles, it creates a lot of heat. That heat can easily cause water to evaporate. And if that water was to just evaporate out of their body, the bees would die. So they have a coating of wax on their body. That's what makes your bees shiny. They have that coating of wax to keep the water inside of their body. However, that coating of wax is deposited while they're transitioning from being a larva to a pupa, a pupa into an adult. And what tissue do you think makes that wax? <laughs> there we go. All right, y'all. All right. Just making sure we're still on this. Now, when the fat body's processes are disrupted, when the mites feed on those bees while they're developing into adult bees, for some reason... Smaller amounts of that wax are deposited on the outside of the bee's body. Some sections of their body have the wax totally missing. Water evaporates through those sections and those bees die of desiccation. We have not understood since this was discovered in 2001 uh, why it is that the, the removal of a small amount of the bee's blood would cause them to not be able to produce wax properly. And remember, the fat body is part of the wax gland. It creates all the precursors that create the wax that they use to build the colony, too. So if your bees are having a difficult time building things out, you might want to check for the mites to determine if they're damaging the organ that allows them to do that. Temperature regulation is also regulated by the... Correct? Um, there, it's not just the fact that the fat body insulates the inside of their body and allows them to regulate their temperature when they're cold. Uh, but it's the fact that the fat body, like the hypothalamus in human beings, uh, is able to, through a system of hormones, tell the bee when it's too hot uh, or too cold and that it needs to regulate its body temperature. We found that when Varroa feed on bees, they are less able to determine when they are too cold. And oftentimes during the winter, uh, they find out too late they've reached the point of no return uh, and they're not able to vibrate uh, their flight muscles and warm up the colony to the extent that it needs to be warmed up. The fat body is also, like the liver in human beings, the primary site of the detoxification of uh, xenobiotics that get into the organism's body. Or xenobiotics, not just xenobiotics, but chemicals that get into the organism's body. And so when bees have been fed on by Varroa, pesticides that they've been exposed to in amounts that were considered to be sublethal then become lethal because they don't have the tissue necessary to break those things down into constituent parts that would not hurt the bee's body. And let me tell you this, the immune system of the bees is predicated on the fat body working properly because the fat body produces something called antimicrobial peptides. And these antimicrobial peptides are the first line of defense the moment that a bee has some sort of uh, microbe inside of its body that should not be there. The antimicrobial peptides go there, um, they perforate the organism, they slow down its ability to reproduce, and they signal uh, larger cells, uh, large cells inside of the bee's blood to go there and attack those microbes. When the antimicrobial peptides are not present, the immune system does not function properly, which does help us to explain why those bacteria were inside of the wound site and just growing and developing like there was no problem at all. And additionally, vitellogenesis one of the most important processes inside of your bees. Vitellogenesis is the process of producing vitellogenins. Vitellogenins are egg yolk proteins. Every creature that makes eggs has egg yolk proteins. So why would this matter? Um, you might be thinking, Varroa don't feed on queens and they're the only ones making eggs. Why does it matter if they impact the tissue that allows for uh, an organism to stock its eggs with egg yolk? Well, the bees have figured out there's only one individual in the entire colony that will ever reproduce. And so, what are we doing making all these vitellogenins and just wasting them? Why don't we take them into our bodies and use them for something useful? The primary thing that makes vitellogenins so useful is that they reduce oxidative stress. And oxidative stress is what makes you age. Uh, you don't want your babies aging before they're born, so of course you want to put them in eggs. That's a great place for them. 
But the bees have decided if we stock them in our fat bodies, we can extend our lifespan during the winter when it would be incredibly detrimental for us to age. And so now you have bees that normally live 30 to 45 days that are able to slow down the aging process substantially so that they can live huge amounts of time. In some of the colder areas, they can live a full six months just because of the vitelligenins they've stocked up. When varroa is present in the colonies feeding on these bees, it sucks these out of their body uh, and they have less to then use during that period of time. And every, the amount of them that they remove shortens their lifespan um, uh, precipitously. So keep that in mind. So last thing that I need to tell you guys is that uh, I fully expected that when, um, I fully expected that in a, present, uh, in, in a study of this nature, that in order to fully convince people that what we think is going on here is actually going on here, uh, we needed to show very clearly that not only are the mites feeding on the bee's fat body in the adult bees, but also in the brood. Because we were pretty sure that someone was going to, to raise their hand and say, well, you only show that in the adults. What about in the larvae? Well, the only period of time that they feed on the larvae is during the reproductive phase when they're producing eggs. And so in order to really get a, a chance to figure this out, I wanted to try a, a different sort of experiment. I wanted to feed the mites fat body or hemolymph and see whether they were able to survive and reproduce. Um, and so uh, very quickly, um, I created some diets that were just made out of bee tissue. Uh, I stuck a needle into the bee, sucked out some of his blood and fed that to the mites or uh, remove the fat body and fed that to the mites, or mix the two of them together uh, in a specific proportion, 50%, 75%, something of that nature. But the reason why this study, uh, which sounds very simple, was such a daunting task, people have been trying to feed Varroa in the lab since the 1980s, and no one has ever been able to get it to work. They haven't been able to get the mites to reproduce, uh, they have not been able to get the mites to survive for more than about three days uh, on these diets. And so uh, when I told my advisor that I was going to do this, he was really nervous. He's like, Sammy, you told me already that you don't want to be a career graduate student. If you undertake something like this, you might be here for the next 11 years. But I decided I was going to try it anyway because I get really curious and hyper-focused on the subject and really want to know the answer. The very first thing that I had to do was create these little mite motels. They are made out of compressed beeswax, and they are the exact uh, size and dimensions of uh, drone cells, so that these mites would be very happy. Uh, we made them out of uh, compressed beeswax. But that was the easy part. The tough part was actually feeding these mites, because you can't just deposit the food in front of them. You have to package it like it's inside of a bee. And so I had to create a decoy bee. Maybe you guys noticed here, but one of these things is not like the other. <laughs> one of these things is not brood. Uh, so this is uh, worker bee, um, the worker bee pupa. Uh, this is worker bee um, uh, pre-pupa, so larva. And this object in the middle is my decoy bee. It is made from a size five gelatin capsule. Uh, and that gelatin capsule is not enough to get the mites to feed on it. We took the gel capsule, we wrapped it in a little bit of parafilm. We thought we'll put some food inside of this and the mites will feed. Incorrect. The mites, it doesn't matter that that gel capsule looks like a bee. What matters most, because remember, I told you guys already, Varroa have no eyes. It needs to feel and smell like a bee. And so I actually had to take that parafilm, stretch it really thin, so it's the same thinness as the bee's um, skin. Now, we use the electron microscope to measure their skin. It's 15 microns thin. If you take 15 bacteria and stack them up on top of each other, that's how thin it is. We had to stretch this really, really, really thin and then rub it against bees so that it smelled like them and that smelled and tasted like them, and that is what it actually took to get them to feed through the membrane. Um, the bottom of the pill was cut away. We stretched that very thin layer of parafilm onto the pill and put, uh, it used needles to actually inject either the blood of the bees or the fat body into the pill. Um, this is what the, the, the whole setup looked like, and this is the end of the presentation. Just want you guys to know, but I got one more question for you. This is the only question in the entire presentation for which the answer will not be Fat body, okay? All right. Now, uh, we use cling wrap as the lid on these cells so we can see right through them. And so you've got the, the, the decoy pupa, you've got your varroa mite in there, there's the cling wrap and the wax cell. What do you think that object is right there? We found it on the cling wrap. When I first started doing these studies, 
the very first trial I found this. And uh, I want to know if you guys have any ideas. You said what now? Might poop? What do you think? Male You think it's a male varroa? Any other guesses? Did somebody say eggs? Very nice. So it is, uh, well, let me tell you. I thought it was an egg, and I got really excited because nobody's been able to get these guys to produce eggs in the lab, but it was four o'clock in the morning, and I was a very, very sleepy graduate student, and I thought, you know, I may very well be hallucinating. So I, I chilled out, uh, went to sleep, and waited until the next morning when we can get this into the electron microscope, and it turns out that, everyone, is a Varroa egg. And I could not have been more excited because the only trials where they started making these things, you can probably guess at this point, right? The fat body trials. And so at this point, I was like, all right, it's over. Uh, I was so excited. I was really proud of this little girl right here. I was really proud of this egg. Matter of fact, I was so proud, I even named her. Her name is PhD. <laughs> She's adorable, isn't she? A little PhD right there. I love her. I love her. Um, because seriously, at this point, they're going to give me my PhD. So I was really excited about that, and it helps to show you why this graph is so interesting. Because when you starve Varroa, no eggs, when you feed them the blood of the bees, the hemolymph, there is no significant difference in the amount of eggs produced when they're starved and when they're fed the bees' blood. However, if you feed them fat body, 25% fat body, 50% fat body, 100% fat body, they will produce eggs. And the more fat body that you add to their diet, the more eggs they will produce. In addition to that, this survivorship curve shows you that the mites don't survive well when given hemolymph. This, uh, the, the, the crashing line that you see right here is the population of the mites that were starved. Uh, and by 24 hours, 80% of them are dead. And by 48 hours, every single one of those mites were dead. And the hemolymph line is a blue line. The reason why it's difficult to see is because it's being hidden by the black line because they had pretty much the same curve. If you fed the bees blood or if you starved them, they died at the same rate. And by 48 hours, all of them were dead. However, if you fed them fat body, those were the only mites able to survive the full seven day duration of the study. This yellow line that continues all the way through to the end. Even if you only fed them 50% fat body, uh, or if you fed them entirely fat body, they could survive the full study. So if you want to know more about this project, uh, it was actually recently published with the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, which I was super excited about because it's difficult to get your, your thesis research in there. And they, not only that, it's very rare for that to happen, but not only that, uh, it actually made the cover. And so you may remember this uh, image from earlier that I was really excited about. <laughs> that one made the cover. Super cool. Okay, all right, so um, it is available open access. So if any of you want to know more about this project or you want access to the images that you saw in it, um, my lab actually paid the $4,000 that it takes to make these, $3,000 that it takes to make these open access. Um, so you don't have to pay any money. You can get these images. They're all um, freely available because that's how I like to do science. I like for there to be no paywall and for you to have as few barriers as possible. So thank you very much for listening to that presentation. You already know the conclusions from it. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge our funding source was Project Apis M and all the help the United States Department of Agriculture provided uh, in letting us use those microscopes that um, were able to produce those wonderful images for you. Uh, I'm not sure if there is any time for questions, but if there is, I would love to answer them. Thank you very much, everyone.